we'll get started here. Uh, I know we still have some people coming in for this presentation here today, but I wanna welcome everybody here today. Uh, this presentation is on improving your safety culture. Uh, I am your host, my name is Danny Thomas, uh, and I look forward to presenting today with everybody. Uh, before we get started, I, I would just kindly ask that everyone please make sure you're muted, whether you're on a phone or whether you're on your computer. That way there's no background noise during the presentation and can, it can just be distracting. Um, we are going to have some interaction throughout this presentation. I'll ask, I'll ask some questions. I highly encourage interaction and feedback. So in those cases, please feel free to unmute yourself. And, and provide feedback or answers to questions that I might ask throughout this. Because again, I, I encourage that, that active participation as we go through. So I wanna start by asking a simple question when it comes to safety. How many of us have experienced any of these in our work environments, whether it's production being more important than safety or lack of employee engagement? feeling like employees are not fully bought in. How many of us have experienced that when it comes to safety? Okay, I see some hands raised. Yeah, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, this has been our experience over the years. And it's really the purpose of this training here today. It's not all that uncommon. And the reason why is because most people, most managers do not really have any sort of formal training when it comes to safety or training on the methods and safety. There's a, let's say a lack of understanding when it comes to safety. And that's, that's, the, that's what leads to these sorts of results. What ends up happening is many organizations become locked into this old school, we'll say sort of mindset where it's assumed that if employees just chose to work safely, incidents would not happen. And it leads to these sorts of results. The good news is that there are very simple and practical things that we can do in the workplace and implement to change these sorts of results that we might experience. There are very simple and practical things we can do. And that's what we're gonna cover here today, how to improve that. So to begin, I want to touch on uh, the three most basic occupational cultures that we might find ourselves in. The first one is pathological. And I'll say that this is the least desired culture any of us would want to be in. This is a sort of culture where uh, it's, it's more about being power oriented. This is where we find responsibilities being shunned. We find that if there's a failure, it's often covered up we find that information is hidden. We hear things like, it's the way I've always done it. Um, we hear things like, if it's, uh, who cares if it's safe, just get the job done. That's a sort of what we experience when it comes to a pathological culture. Not, not the type of culture that many of us would wanna find ourselves in. A step up from pathological is what's called a bureaucratic culture. Uh, again, this is a bit of an improvement, but still not in the optimal culture we would want to find ourselves. So this is really more rule oriented. You get sort of a, a modest cooperation, modest buy-in, and there's this sort of growing interest to want to do things right and, and instill best work practices. But when it comes to safety in this culture, it's still mainly technical and procedural. It's still mainly checking off boxes. We find that in this sort of culture that failure seeks justice. How many of us have experienced when there's a failure in our company or when there's an injury that there's the fault finding, that there's the blame game, that there's the finger pointing? How many of us find that to be an experience? I see some heads nodding. I see some hands raised. Yeah, many of us probably experience that. And it just really leads to negativity in the workplace. So the optimal type of culture we would want to find ourselves in would, is what is referred to as a generative culture. This is a performance-oriented culture. This is where shared values and shared responsibilities are in place. This is where we find failure 
leading to inquiry. It's not being covered up. It's not seeking justice. It's where it leads to lessons learned. We also have in this sort of culture where new ideas are encouraged, you get a high level of cooperation. There's this sort of mindset in this culture that, hey, safety is how we do business. This is a part of our culture. So I wanna simplify safety and I wanna provide the most simplistic way that safety should be thought of. And really what safety is, it is a motivational science when you think of it in the most simplistic way. We have to be able to persuade others and we have to be able to motivate, but how do we do that? Well, there's three basic ways that we motivate. Uh, we make the topic relevant, we make it personal, uh, personal, we make it relatable, we make it easy to understand. So it needs to be personal. We need to be able to explain why it benefits a person. It needs to be relatable. We need to show why it's relevant, why it's applicable. And it needs to be easy to understand. We need to make it simple. And then on the other end of this is the fact that it's a science. Every event has a cause. For example, if an injury happens, there is a reason why it happened. And having that understanding is important in moving forward. So the most simplistic way that we should think of safety is as a motivational science. So our objectives today, there are four main objectives. Uh, the first one is to look at some of the flawed safety paradigms. There are some flawed ways of thinking that we often have an experience in the workplace. And it's important to first unravel some of those flawed paradigms that we might experience in order to move forward. So we're gonna focus on that in part one. Part two focuses on safety that works. How do we implement effective safety controls in the workplace? Part three is establishing a zero injury safety culture. How can we effectively implement a zero injury safety culture? And part four is to wrap it all up in the conclusion. So just a little bit more about me uh, before we really dig in. I'm a safety professional. Again, my name is Danny Thomas. I work for SOS Safety Solutions. Uh, I went to Grand Valley State University with a degree, a bachelor's degree in occupational safety and health management. Uh, and I live in Michigan. So part one, the flawed safety paradigms. And I wanna start out by talking about some of the things that we might hear in the workplace or even some of the ways that we might think in the workplace uh, that are really flawed ways of thinking. And I kind of refer to these as the safety cop-outs. And I kind of wanna unravel these because again, it's important for us to understand some of the things that we might be doing wrong before we actually effectively improve in the workplace. So the first thing that we might hear or that we might even think in the workplace is something like it's the employee's fault. If an injury happens, it's the employee's fault. But the thing about this is that by blaming an employee and saying that it's the employee's fault, this does not solve the problem. This is not a corrective action. This does not lead to uh, improved working environment simply by blaming the employee or saying that it's the employee's fault but this can often be an experience we find in the workplace. Another one we might hear is safety is plain common sense. But when you think of common sense, it's not something that can be definitively defined. It's an intangible concept. What is common sense? What's common sense to me may not be common sense to other people on this call and vice versa. So this again, is often something that we think of in the workplace, but it's not necessarily true. And when you think about it as well, it's not a corrective action. Simply uh, re uh, resorting to say that safety is plain common sense, that does not solve the issue. That is not a corrective action after an incident has occurred. So that does not lead to an improved working environment. Another one that we might hear or think, accidents just happen. Injuries must never be thought of as just a routine part of the job. We should never be having a work environment where 
that just is going to happen. Or that's the sort of thought process where, hey, we're going to go to work and you might get injured. And that's just a part of the working environment. That should never be an expectation. Who wants to work in an environment like that where part of the job entails us getting hurt? Who of us wants to work in that sort of environment? I see some heads shaking. No, that's not the sort of environment we want to be in. But sometimes this is the sort of persona that's put into place. And sometimes this is what is communicated. If it's unsafe, anybody can shut it down. This is another one we hear. But this creates a lose-lose situation when you think about it. On the one end, if a person shuts down an unsafe operation, then there's always a potential for backlash because the person is slowing down production, right? Production is being slowed. But on the other side of it, if a person doesn't shut down an unsafe job and something then happens, that person might get in trouble. Why didn't you shut it down? So the point here is that supervisors and the managers, they're the ones that need to take ownership and responsibility for shutting down jobs that are unsafe. It's not something that just anybody can do. We might try to think that way. Maybe that's how we think it should be, but the reality is that that is just not the case. And the last one I want to cover is safety is everybody's responsibility. And for this one, this might be surprising to some people because this seems to be a common one in the workplace. And so I want to touch on this briefly here. Really what this communicates when we say safety is everybody's responsibility, it communicates if you get injured, it's your fault. Or it communicates do your own thing, but if you get hurt, you're in trouble because safety is your responsibility. Let me ask the question. If safety is everybody's responsibility, then why do we need management? Why do we need supervisors? Why do we need team leads if it's everybody's responsibility? The reality is that all of us are responsible for safety, yes, but within the limits of our authority. Does that make sense to everybody? A fellow worker has very little authority over his or her coworker. So we need to think of it in that respect when it comes to that. Any questions on any of these or comments? Okay. So I wanna ask this question. Does the responsibility of safety belong in the safety department? And feel free to answer, feel free to take yourself off mute uh, because like I said, I highly encourage participation. What do we think of this? Does the responsibility of safety belong in the safety department? The responsibility of safety is everybody's responsibility. Okay kind of like what we talked about in the last slide, where it's, it's a responsibility within your, your realm of, of authority, let's say. Okay, so when we talk about the responsibility of safety, oftentimes what we find is that the thought is that it's placed in the safety department. The responsibility is placed within the safety department, but that's not how it should be. The responsibility of safety does not belong in the safety department. And the reason for this is that it belongs with line management from the lowest level of management to the CEO, because the safety department seldom has the authority to carry that burden of safety. Employees do not re uh, report to the safety department. Employees report to management. It's management that, that makes the paychecks. It's not the safety department. So the responsibility of safety cannot fall within the safety department. And oftentimes this is misunderstood. So what is the safety department's responsibility? The safety department is responsible essentially to act as a resource, to guide, to educate, to train, and to motivate levels, all levels within an organization um, to provide, uh, to act as a resource to upper management, to coordinate ongoing safety initiatives and activities. These are the responsibilities of safety, but oftentimes that gets misunderstood. 
So I have a true or false question here. The reality is that an employee can always refuse to complete an unsafe job. True or false? And again, I encourage people to take themselves off mute if you would wish uh, to participate. What's that? I didn't catch that. Oh, uh, I think there's true. We got a true, got a false. Okay. Um, so this is actually false and I'll explain why. That's Here, true. What's that? Um, sorry. Oh, I... <laughs> so the answer to this question is actually false. And then the purpose here is not to put anybody on the spot. The purpose is to, to help us to get us thinking. And I'll explain why this is false. Theoretically, yes, a person can refuse to complete an unsafe job. But the reality is that employees do not make up their minds by themselves in this fashion in the workplace. Whether we like to admit it or not, peer pressure often plays a role in the workplace. It does. And some of us may not want to accept that, but it does. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you have 10 roofers that are working uh, on an elevated uh, roof and none of them are wearing fall protection. And there's a newer employee who wants to wear fall protection. Isn't it fair to think that that one employee might feel pressure to not wear fall protection, to be like everybody else? Don't we think that that's a possibility? That does play a factor and that is the reality. And the point here is that it starts with management. If, and the reason why is because management gets what management wants. If a manager asks an employee to work quicker, the employee is going to do that most likely because that means the employee's job. So if management sets the expectation, for example, that roofers are supposed to be wearing fall protection, then employees are going to feel peer pressure, but in a positive way they're gonna feel peer pressure to perform the job safely and to wear fall protection as they should. It does have an impact. And that's the main point here is that peer pressure does have an impact in the workplace. And it's important to understand that. So my last question for this section, is safety really first? What do we think? I see some heads maybe nodding a little bit. I we think know that it's, what's that? Go ahead. I think it's, it's really first. I think safety is first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we know that it should be. We know that safety should be because it sort of fulfills a moral obligation in that we want employees to go home the same way that they came in. So we know that it should be. But oftentimes our experience may say otherwise that maybe safety isn't really first. And that sometimes can be our experience in the workplace. We might see safety signs that say safety first and, and it may be communicated, but oftentimes that may not be the experience. And really what this comes down to is we want to instill a culture where managers and supervisors and essentially everybody refuses to walk by an unsafe situation or an unsafe act without addressing it and without doing something. When you think about it, if a manager or a supervisor walks by an unsafe situation or an unsafe act, what does that do? It sends a loud and clear message that it's okay to breach safety requirements. And that's what is observed. So safety first, if safety is to be first, it requires us to refuse to walk by unsafe situations and unsafe acts. And that again, that starts with management and supervision. So any questions or comments or anything that we've covered so far? So that brings us to part two, safety that works. 
And again, this is about implementing effective safety controls in the workplace. And it really starts with communication. We have to have effective communication. Again, this goes back to the motivational aspect of safety being a motivational science. And what we wanna do is we wanna simplify safety. We wanna make it understandable. We wanna make it easy to recognize. And so I have here laid out tangible concepts versus intangible concepts. And I'll, I'll provide a scenario just to help us th think through this in order to effectively communicate. So if you go to the doctor and you're looking for advice for the doctor to give you on, on living uh, a healthier lifestyle, what would you rather have your doctor tell you? Would you rather your doctor tell you, think healthy, live healthy, or would you rather your doctor tell you tangible things to do, like drink at least 100 ounces of water daily, exercise on a routine basis, eat fruits and vegetables, limit soda intake or limit sugars? Which would we rather our doctor tell us? The tangible concepts, the simplified uh, ideas of what a healthy lifestyle looks like. But oftentimes when it comes to safety, we are referring to intangible concepts. Intangible concepts can be confusing and misunderstood. We often hear things like think safe, work safe. But what does that actually mean? That is very hard to define. What does thinking safe even look like? It's very difficult to understand that. And so what we want to communicate with are, like I said, tangible concepts. We want to simplify safety, make it recognizable and easy to understand. So when it comes to safety, we want to use simple safety concepts, pointing out what does good housekeeping look like? What are the steps? And these are just examples. What are steps to properly perform lockout tagout? What does inadequate machine guarding look like? How do we properly uh, mark aisle pass? What are the training needs that we have? What training have we completed? And what do we need to um, complete in the future? How should a lifting sling look if it's in proper working order? Uh, what should be inspected for a forklift prior to use? These are tangible ideas and easy to understand concepts. And this is what we should be using to communicate when it comes to safety. Another important aspect of safety is accountability. We wanna have effective accountability. If you have trainings in place, you have procedures in place, you have policies in place, but you don't hold employees accountable to the trainings, to the policies, to the procedures, what do you have? What good is that? It doesn't really do much. So we wanna ensure that we have accountability. And this is an effective way that we can ensure accountability is instilled in the workplace. So let's say you have a safety issue, you have a safety problem. Step one is to define the problem. You wanna define the problem to the point where it's clearly and objectively identified and it's tangibly understood. That's step one. Step two is to agree on an expectation there should be an agreement upon all parties involved. This allows opportunity uh, for feedback and buy-in from in frontline employees. We talked about how employee engagement was one of the challenges that we find at one of the first slides that we went through. This is an area where we can improve on that, is to agree on an expectation. Instead of just management rolling out what the expectation is, Ask for feedback from the employees. What are the limitations? Is this expectation doable? Is this expectation feasible? We should be allowing for that feedback and for that engagement. And that helps establish that buy-in when in this collective mindset for safety. Number three is to establish an effective measurement. If we are unable to establish an effective measurement for accountability when it comes to safety, we have not clearly defined the problem and we need to go back to step one. If we cannot establish a measurement, we have to be able to establish a measurement so that we can track performance, so that we can see how well we are improving. And this can be through internal safety audits, internal safety inspections, training records, hazard analysis. 
these are ways that we can track improvement and see how we're doing when it comes to safety. And then step four is to recognize improvement. This is crucial in maintaining a positive working environment. Oftentimes, safety can have a negative sentiment tied to it. Because what often happens is, all it is is pointing out everything you're doing wrong when it comes to safety. But if we're in our jobs, how many of us would enjoy our work if all we're told is everything we're doing wrong all day, every day? How many of us would enjoy our job? I see a lot of head shaking, right? That is not, some, that is not the sort of environment we wanna find ourselves in. Safety is no different. When all people are told is everything they're doing wrong, they are going to think negatively towards safety. So what we should be doing is pointing out everything people are doing right when it comes to safety, because that helps to instill a positive culture and more buy-in for safety, instead of just pointing out things that are, are wrong when it comes to safety. That's a crucial part. So I have another true or false question here. A company would be considered safer if its injury frequency rate has diminished by 50%, despite the fact that management has not done anything differently regarding safety. What do we think? True or false? Again, I encourage uh, anybody's feedback. And feel free to take yourself off mute. True, okay. Anybody else? I think it would be, it could be false. They could just not be reporting the injuries now because they think they'll be in trouble if they are expecting to improve. That's a great point. That, that is a great point. Yeah, this, this is actually false. If this situation were to happen and nothing had been done, but the frequency rate has diminished nonetheless, a company is simply a luckier company. It's not a safer company, it's simply a luckier company. And that brings me to my next point of the luck factor in safety. And this goes against a lot of things that we might hear when it comes to safety. This also is another inaccurate perception we can have regarding safety. I see signs in the workplace during visits that I have, there is no luck in safety. And that just isn't true. And I'll give some examples here. So let's say you have a, a, a car that drives through an intersection, a red light, that speeds through a red light. That is clearly an unsafe act, okay? Luck factor one determines whether or not this unsafe act will result in a near miss or contact. Is this going to, is this person going to get lucky driving through the intersection unsafely without there being any impact? Or is there going to be an energy exchange? If there's an energy exchange, well, you've been unlucky based upon that unsafe act. If you make it through the intersection, then you're lucky. It's still an unsafe act, nonetheless. Luck factor two, so let's say we were unlucky for luck factor one and there was an energy exchange, there was contact. Luck factor two determines whether or not is this going to be just a minor interruption? This is just an exchange of energy where there's vehicle damage, or is this going to result in injury? If it results in injury, well, then we've been unlucky for luck factor two. And if we're unlucky for luck factor two, then that brings us to luck factor three. Does this result in minor injury or does this result in severe injury. If it results in severe injury, well, then we've been unlucky all for all three of these. Does that make sense to everybody? And the, the purpose of this is to, for us to have the correct perception of what safety is and to better understand that there is luck when we talk about safety. And it's important to talk about this because we need to effectively measure safety. And oftentimes what's used to measure safety or to track our safety performance are things like incident records, incident rates, severity rates, total recordable incident rates. This is often what we use to track safety performance. But these are not safety records. 
These are failure records. Or you could look at these as luck, uh, luck records or how unlucky we've been. That's what these records are. Now, I'm not saying that these are in, uh, not important. We have to record these, especially for uh, OSHA purposes. We should be recording these and these are important to have, but these are not what we should be using to measure safety performance. Because when you think about it too, these are also reactive. Safety is all about being proactive and these are reactive. So what should we be using to track and measure safety performance? Well, we should be thinking of this in a proactive mindset. Frequency and quality of safety inspections, risk assessments. Do we have risk assessments in place? How many do we have? Where do we need to fulfill more risk assessments? Training achievements, what trainings have we accomplished? Where do we need to fill some of the gaps when it comes to training? How many safety observations have we made? How is the near miss reporting? These are proactive when it comes to safety. But like I said, a lot of times we're using things like incident frequency uh, rates to determine our, uh, to, to track our safety performance. And when you think about it, injury frequency, uh, injury severity rates, these things that measure failures in the workplace, this really can ins further instill fear when we're just focusing on these numbers. How many of us have experienced this when the incident frequency rates jump up, that there's more stress, that more people uh, are worried and fearful because we're focusing so much on these for our safety performance? I see some heads nodding. Yeah, that is oftentimes what the result is. And so, like I said, we really need to focus on these proactive measures like frequency and quality of safety inspections, risk assessments. So any questions on anything here? So another important element of instilling an effective safety process is ensuring that we have proper root cause analysis. We have conditions and behaviors that exist in the workplace. Think of these as the symptoms. But what we really wanna find are the root causes. What are underneath the surface? Root causes need to be discovered. They tell us why something has happened, not just what happened. If an employee bypasses a safeguard, this tells us what occurred, but we wanna know why it occurred. The employee bypassed the safeguard, we wanna know why the employee chose to do that. Oftentimes we'll stop at the employee failed to follow the safety process, but what we should be doing is to try to better understand why that even occurred. This helps us further inquire on these lessons learned. And so really what it comes down to when it comes to incident investigations, it needs to be about fact finding. It should never be about fault finding ever. Because by, again, blaming employees, it oversimplifies the safety problem and it diminishes the importance of safe work environments and safety controls. And again, it's not a corrective action. So to get more to the why, behind any incident. These are the sorts of questions that we should be considering and that we should be asking. Was the employee trained adequately? Has management effectively motivated employees to work safely? Has a safe work environment been created for employees? When was the last safety inspection? What systems and controls are in place to mitigate risks? Where can we improve? These are questions that we should continue to ask anytime an incident occurs, instead of just stopping at the employee failed to follow the procedure. Because again, that goes back to kind of the blame thing of blaming the employee. And again, this has to be about fact finding. That's not me saying that there can't be accountability. Of course, there has to be accountability. But this is about getting to the why. That's what we want to find out when it comes to root cause analysis. So to close out this section, I have some questions here, just as sort of a self-reflection for management. 
And these are questions that we should continuously be asking in our work settings because safety is an ongoing continuous improvement process. So we should be constantly asking, do employees report hazards on an ongoing basis? How do my actions show that I am committed to safety? Uh, have I been showing my employees that I care for their well being? Am I visible in safety meetings and on the floor engaging in workplace safety activities? When I, when I see a hazard, do I just walk by it or do I take follow up action when I see a hazard? If there is an incident that were to occur, where do I think that would occur? Where, what must I do to maybe prevent that future incident? Having that proactive thinking. Have I had discussions with employees on their attitudes towards safety? When was the last time I encouraged somebody and gave positive feedback on safety? and a good job that they did when it came to following safety protocol. These are questions, again, that we should be continuously asking every day in order to continue instilling positive safety controls in the workplace. So that takes us to part three. And this is a zero, establishing a zero injury safety culture. This is the optimal goal. Zero injuries in the workplace. This is what we are looking to achieve. And anytime an incident does occur in the workplace, again, safety being the motivational science that it is, there's a reason why it happened. Every effect has a cause. If there is an incident that occurs, it's the result of some sort of systematic failure that resulted in the incident. And the objective is to establish a zero injury safety culture. And what this comes down to is looking underneath the surface. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about root cause analysis, understanding the why, but kind of applying this to the company, to, the, to our operations as a whole. The tip of the iceberg, these are the conditions and the behaviors that exist. Those are, some, those are the symptoms that exist in the workplace. But what we wanna understand is why those conditions and those behaviors are present in the workplace. And the most basic way to do this, and this is the foundation for any safety program, is a risk assessment. For us to have a company where it's injury free, where there are zero injuries that occur, the company must first eliminate the chance of undesired events from happening. But before a company can eliminate the chance of undesired events from happening, it must first remove all unsafe acts and situations from the workplace. But before a company can remove unsafe acts and situations, the company must ensure effective control measures. And before effective control measures can be in place, you must understand the risk. You must be able to assess the risk. So it starts with the risk assessment. And there's two questions that the risk assessment asks. What is the probability that an undesired event will happen? And if an undesired event happens, what will the likely level of severity be? In the risk assessment steps, there are four basic steps. Step one is to review the task, review the operation. We want to look at what tools are being used, what equipment is being used, what does the environment look like? What are the work methods? Step two is to identify the hazards associated with the tasks being conducted. And a hazard is anything that can result in an injury. So we want to identify those hazards that are associated with those tasks. Step three is to assess the risk level. We want to assess, and we do this by assessing the probability of an incident occurring and assessing the likely severity of an incident occurring. That's how we determine the risk level based upon having reviewed the tasks and identifying the hazards. And then step four, we want to evaluate if the risk is acceptable and whether or not control measures are still needed. So I have here, a, a risk assessment template. And this is something that is 
uh, very easy to use, but is so useful when it comes to establishing effective safety controls. Because again, in order to have a zero injury safety culture, we have to be able to assess and understand the risks. And we do that with a risk assessment. And again, so the basic concept here is to identify who is involved, what task is being conducted, what hazards exist, is it a cut hazard, are there ergonomic risks, is it uh, a thermal hazard, is it uh, equipment operational hazard, hazardous motion, then we determine what is the severity and probability level. And if you look in the bottom left corner, there's a key here, which gives us a rating when we compare the severity of harm to the probability of, of an occurrence happening. And so from that, we can deem whether or not a task is high risk, medium risk, risk low risk, or negligible risk. This helps us better identify that. In order to tell us, is this risk acceptable? or do we need to have further follow-up control measures implemented to make it an acceptable risk? So any questions on anything about risk assessments? And again, just stop me if you have any questions. So once we've identified the risks and we've assessed the risk that exists in the workplace, we want to ensure effective control measures are implemented. And the best way to do that is to utilize the hierarchy of controls. And so the, the top control measure that we could utilize would be elimination. This is to remove the hazard completely from a work environment. If you remove the hazard, the hazard does not exist anymore. And so that's the most preferred option. But sometimes this is not feasible. Sometimes this cannot be done. So the next control measure would be substitution, replacing the existing hazard with something that is safer. That would be substitution. But if that perhaps is not feasible, the next step would be engineered controls. This would be isolating employees from the hazard, things like adding barrier guards, adding machine guarding. That would be an example of engineered controls. If say that's not feasible, the next step would be administrative controls. How can we improve the work environment? How can we modify how employees work? Do we need to improve training? Do we need to establish a procedure? Do we need to improve the procedure? Those would be examples of administrative controls. And then the last one would be personal protective equipment, providing PPE to employees to help protect them in their operations. So that takes us to part four, which is the conclusion. And perhaps the most important question that we can ask is why safety? We all have a why, and it's important for us to understand what that why is. And Safety really fulfills four main obligations within any business. There's a moral obligation tied to it. I mentioned this before, employee well-being must never be knowingly or intentionally compromised for any reason. Our goal, our job has to be sending people home the same way they came in because that's just right. It's just the right thing to do morally. It also fulfills a, a performance obligation. When people feel valued, what happens? Their morale goes up. And what happens when their morale goes up? Productivity goes up, efficiency goes up. How can we say we value employees when their well-being is not a priority? If somebody's safety is not a top priority, how is that person going to feel valued? I mean, that's one of the most basic things that should be reflected is that an employee's well-being is a top priority. And when it is, their performance goes up. When an employee feels valued, their, their performance goes up. Their efficiency grow, goes up. It also fulfills a business obligation. Through effective safety control measures, 
it saves money. It's a cost savings approach. As incident goes up, as, as incidents go up and losses go up, it increases costs. It increases uh, insurance costs. But as we drive down those costs, it helps us to save money. And then there's also a legal obligation tied to it. Federal law states that a company is to fully furnish a workplace that is free of recognized hazards uh, that are causing or are likely to cause serious harm. This is the OSHA general duty clause. So these are the four main obligations that safety has. Uh, and, and really within these four, we can find our why when it comes to safety and promoting that in the workplace. So in wrapping up, these were some of the main points that we covered here today. Uh, number one, injuries, they occur due to systemic defects within the overall organization. It's not just employees choosing to work unsafely. There's always going to be systemic defects if a safety incident or safety issue occurs. We talked about where the responsibility of safety belongs. The responsibility of safety belongs with management, not with the safety department. We also want to simplify safety when we communicate it using tangible concepts, not intangible concepts. We talked about effective measurements for safety. Incident frequency and incident severity rates, those are not safety measurements. Incident investigation, it's all about fact finding. We wanna find that root cause and we, we don't wanna play the blame game. We want to just simply find the facts what happened and why did it happen? And proper risk assessment helps us determine why conditions exist instead of just what conditions exist. And that's really where it starts, again, is with a risk assessment when it comes to uh, improving safety in the workplace. So that concludes our presentation today. Are there any questions, any feedback, any comments anybody has? I also have my contact information here. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to me at any time if you have further questions or, or anything of that matter, and I would be happy to, to help in any way. Uh, and also be sure to leave us a Google review. We very much value your feedback uh, for these types of presentations. Um, yeah, and that's, that's really it for my end. Rose, do you have anything that you wanted to add? No, that's all. Thank you, Danny. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, everybody. Have a Thank great you. rest of your day and rest of your week. Bye everyone. Bye.